Well, this may not seem a wise move to make in January, but now we're moving north over the Alps to Northern Europe. By the way, even though the Isenheim altarpiece was included in your homework and the quiz, I've decided to discuss it in the last lecture of this unit. Today, I want to focus on 15th century works, that is, works contemporary with the early Italian Renaissance paintings that you just saw. The Northern Renaissance artists are among my very favorite, but I've picked up that students don't usually share my enthusiasm. The biggest problem, I think, is that these paintings need to be seen in person, that is, in a museum or a church, and not as a slide or a photo in a book. The great innovation of the Northern Renaissance artists was the introduction of oil painting. This new medium gave these paintings a whole new range of color and the emotion that only oil can truly capture. They also allow paintings to represent and reflect light in a way never seen before. The Northern Renaissance artists were also masters of detail, especially domestic household details, many of which had symbolic meanings. In other words, these paintings really reward close and up-close study. But there's nothing I can do about that, so on to the Northern Renaissance. I've talked about the commercial revolution and how a rising merchant elite in Italy promoted artistic innovation in art as well as in commerce. Well, we see a similar phenomenon in Northern Europe, especially after Portuguese and Spanish navigators discover the New World and the center of trade moved to the Atlantic. Flanders lay at the heart of the Northern Commercial Revolution, as you can see here, it lay at the heart of Europe. It's an area that now encompasses Holland, Belgium, parts of Northern France. In this unit, Flanders is ruled first by the Dukes of Burgundy and then by the Holy Roman Empire. You can see from the map that Flanders was strategically located for trade uh, through the, with the Atlantic ports and also throughout Europe. The flat topography also made land travel into the heart of Europe relatively easy. Like Florence, Flanders included rich industrial and banking cities that allowed a large middle class population to flourish. The court of the Dukes of Burgundy were the most important patrons during this time, but new wealthy, newly wealthy private citizens also commissioned religious art as part of a growing interest in private meditation and prayer in the home. They also commissioned portraits in growing numbers, basically to show off their newfound wealth. Religious confraternities also became important art patrons. Now, these were lay brotherhoods that emerged and greatly expanded at the same time that the Franciscans and Dominicans were establishing uh, and preaching urban congregations and preaching to urban congregations. These brotherhoods focused on religious education, on charitable works, and on fellowship with one another. This painting, which is actually Italian, shows a confraternity organized by Dominican friars. Northern Europe was still entirely Catholic at this point. We're not at the Re Reformation just yet. But the rising importance of lay organizations in Flanders and what would become Germany and the Netherlands did partly reflect a growing dissatisfaction in the North with the church hierarchy, which of course was based in Rome and very focused at this point in history on enriching Rome. Remember that this was a period too when the Catholic Church suffered major schisms as the papacy first moved to Avignon and then suffered through a period when there were competing popes in Avignon and Rome. That schism is just coming to an end as we begin this unit. The discord in the church combined with what seemed like the church's, the clergy's growing corruption and preoccupation with wealth, also led to a search for a more individual, personal religion. And this gave rise to a new market for personal devotional art for the home. The Marode altarpiece is an example. It's surprisingly small. When I took my husband to see this in the cloisters, the Metropolitan Museum of Art's medieval museum, he commented that he'd probably just passed this work by on earlier visits, even though it's one of the gems of the collection. As our Khan Academy experts noted, what really stands out about this altarpiece is its domestic use and its domestic setting. The work really challenges the separation between heaven and earth. As for that matter, the Annunciation itself does. So we see the patrons kneeling outside the room where the Annunciation takes place, and it's easy to imagine that the room is a real room in their house. This is the earliest Annunciation panel set in a fully detailed domestic interior. 
Note that the artist also made an attempt to render a complete spatial reality. It's not really accurate perspective. Still, we see use of detail in a way that really brings the scene alive. Note the meticulous rendering of small details. And this is enhanced by what was still a techni technical innovation, overlaying translucent oil pigments on top of opaque oil pigments. The result is a luminous, you know, enamel-like sparkling surface mm -hmm. that includes a lot of color values and manages to depict both depth and gradations of light. But the initial impression that this is an ordinary space is actually deceptive. Many of these seemingly ordinary objects also have a second symbolic meaning. The artist has set out to make sacred symbols look like part of the natural world. And this union of symbolism and realism is characteristic of many 15th century Northern European paintings. And it's something the College Board wants you to know, hint. It's a union which makes the secular world sacred, and it may help explain why donors wanted their portraits included in the altarpieces and other religious paintings that they commissioned. So the lily in the pitcher of water symbolizes the, the Virgin's purity. The candle symbolized Christ's divinity, and the fact that it's been extinguished suggests that God has now put on human flesh. We see Joseph making a mouse trap, and that demonstrates that that the church's incarnation, which is being announced in the central panel, God coming to earth, is God's plan for ensnaring the devil. This is probably a reference to a writing by St. Augustine. Uh, he'd written that the incarnation, again, God appearing on earth as Jesus, was God's means of ensnaring the devil, much as a mouse trap traps a mouse. Uh, notice that how exquisitely the artist renders his tools and the metal surface of the candlestick. No one does textures and surfaces better than the painters of the Northern Renaissance and their artistic heirs whom we'll meet in the Dutch Baroque paintings. So what makes this level of detail possible? The answer in part is oil painting. But to discuss this extraordinarily important new medium, let's turn to its master, Jan van Eyck. I want you to watch a video clip, sorry it is not better quality, to get an introduction to this extraordinarily important figure in our history. The Ghent Altarpiece, one of Van Eyck's most famous works, is not one of our required works any longer, but I'm going to use it to talk briefly about altarpieces in general. Before the printing press and the Reformation brought the Bible to the Northern European masses, altarpieces were one of the most important devices for teaching Christian narratives and Christian theology. They were mostly viewed clothes. These polyptychs, or connected multi-panel paintings, would be open during Mass and feast days to reveal a wonderful world of color and action. The series of images allowed artists to create a narrative without employing the somewhat more awkward technique of displaying continuous narration in a single work. These folding altarpieces, by the way, were a northern renaissance feature. Italian altarpieces often had polyptics, but they didn't usually hinge and open and close. So this huge altarpiece, it's 11 and a half by 15 feet when open, still stands in the cathedral in Ghent, a city that's now part of Belgium. We see the wealthy donors at the bottom left and right, and they contrast with that grisaille fake sculpture of the prophets Zechariah and Micah, whom Christian theologians viewed as predicting the Christ's incarnation. Once the politic is open, we enter this brilliantly colored world with multiple layers of meaning, which, alas, I don't have time to decipher for you. But the video you just saw, which is up on Moodle, has a terrific segment on this work if you're interested. The nude figures of Adam and Eve represent an innovation in Northern Renaissance art, probably reflecting an Italian influence. But the highly realistic, detailed, and individualized faces are typical of the North. Note to Adam's foreshortened foot and Eve's partly contrapposto stance. Again, Van Eyck was influenced by trends in the Italian Renaissance, just as the Italian Renaissance was very influenced by his innovations in landscape, in oil painting, and in portraiture. And indeed, here we see Van Eyck's mastery of portraiture. I love Adam in particular. Note that there are highlights in his eyes, but not in Eve's. That's because Adam's side of the altarpiece faced toward the light. This is extraordinary detail and realism. 
And here we see the choir of angels. What I want you to notice here is how beautifully he has rendered cloth. And by the way, Van Eyck does this without using gold leaf. Um, he basically uses oil paint to create this, uh, this golden impression. So many Flanders merchants made their fortunes in the textile trade. They knew their cloth and they cared about it. We're going to see ex beautiful and extremely expensive textiles showcased in the Arnolfini portrait as well. But take a look also at these highly individual faces that are expressing very different responses to the music. So how did Van Eyck achieve these effects? Let's return to our video and look at an explanation of oil paint. So here you see a contrast between two magnificent paintings, one painted in egg tepera, one in oil. So what differences do you notice? Well, yes, we are getting on to our next required work. But first, here's a quick review of the points that the video made about oil. It's slow drying time, let painters add more details and to correct more of their errors. By applying paint in very thin layers or glazes, painters could achieve deeper and more accurate portrayals of surfaces, textures, and reflected light. Oil also produced richer yet more subtly gradated colors. It was really the perfect medium for painting. So, on to the Arnolfini portrait. This is one of the most famous paintings in Western art. You encountered it this summer. Uh, it's a painting that has also stimulated a great deal of argument. It makes me a little nervous teaching this because I don't know which of the many theories the College Board is buying into this year. Uh, it's even undergone a name change. It was previously called the Arnolfini Wedding Portrait. Uh, in fact, the focus of much of the interpretive dispute has been the question of whether the painting documents a marriage, a betrothal, or is simply better understood as a double portrait falling into the class of court portraits. These are very high-ranking officials, Arnolfini, and we're not actually even sure which Arnolfini it was, but the family was associated with the Medici. It was an Italian banking family that had moved to Bruges, another center of finance. Van Eyck was a noted portrait painter for the royal court, and that gives credibility to the last idea. So we see many typical Northern Renaissance elements here. What are they? Well, there's that domestic setting. There are the rich colors, careful, careful portrayal of texture, including metals and textiles. The colors that are both dark and glowing, highly saturated and produced by oil paint. Also typical of Northern Renaissance art, the portrait is allegedly packed with symbols. But be careful here. They are all disputed, and some art historians think that the fancy shoes, the pet dog, the imported fruit, the elaborate chandelier are just evidence of the patron's great wealth and don't carry uh, much other symbolic meaning. Others think it's packed with symbolism. That's how I was taught. So I'm going to mention some of these possible symbols. The removed wooden clogs, for example, may be a reference to the quote in the book of Exodus, put off the shoes from thy feet, in other words, signaling the sacred nature of the event occurring in the chamber. And by the way, the bed was not an indicate that this was a indication this was a bedroom. It was a very fancy piece of furniture, it was basically being shown off. Uh, the, the candelabrum with just one candle burning may symbolize the unity of marriage, while the mirror symbolizes purity. The still life of fruit has been interpreted as symbolizing the innocence of life before Adam and Eve ate the fruit before the fall. But here again, it may be demonstrating that the couple could afford rare and expensive imported fruit, and of course, it may be making both points. Now, there's a new theory about this painting, by the way. Some evidence has emerged that the woman in the painting may actually have died before the portrait was completed. The single extinguished candle might then symbolize death, perhaps even death and childbirth. So maybe she is being portrayed as pregnant, which earlier analyses had denied. And there are uh, extant uh, paintings by Van Eyck that show very pregnant-looking figures who are clearly virgin saints. So again, one more thing that people debate about. Again, not everyone agrees with this new interpretation about the dead Arnolfini bride, and the painting remains something of a mystery. But whether the painting portrays a wedding, a contract, or simply a double portrait, it's clear from the image in the mirror that witnesses were present, and one was apparently the painter himself. That large, bold, formal inscription reads, 
Jan van Eyck was here. Well, of course he was here. He was the painter. So why else might he have said that? Well, remember that van Eyck was an important man in court and in the community. It's quite possible he was called upon to witness an important legal uh, contract, which this may have been, a betrothal, or even some people think con the husband conferring legal privileges on his wife. any rate, I don't know how much time you have left, but I'm hoping you'll be able to watch two short clips about this painting, not least because they present somewhat mm -hmm. contrasting interpretations of the work. From here, we will move back to Italy and to the great artists of the High Renaissance. <laughs> 